you're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. He's dead. Get him down. Yes, Captain. Clemens, what the devil do you think you're doing? Uh, uh, cutting him down, Captain. This is the last of the rope, Clemens. There's still one more to go. Just untie it. For pity's sake, catch him before he falls into the river. Traitor or not, he deserves a decent burial. Captain. The rope's looking pretty f frayed. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure it'll take the weight of another prisoner. It'll have to. But, Captain... I said it'll have to! Yes, sir. You have just witnessed a military execution. Death is a dignitary who, when he comes announced, is to be received with formal manifestations of respect, even by those most familiar with him. This particular execution occurred on Owl Creek Bridge in northern Alabama during the war between the states. You might find it in the works of that past master of the incredible Ambrose Bierce, but its proper home is in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, starring Christian Stolte, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hurry up, Clemens. I want to get this last one hanged while it's still daylight. Almost got him, Captain. Friends are dead, Peyton. That's your name, isn't it? Mr. Peyton Farquhar? Your act of treachery came to nothing, Peyton. And now you'll be called to account. I wouldn't recommend you think of doing anything as stupid as trying to get off this bridge. Apart from the fact that your wrists are tied behind your back. You'll find yourself more than adequately surrounded, whichever way you choose to run. See those sentinels at either end? Please don't get the impression they're just taking a rest. The way they're holding their rifles, they call that the support position. Means they're always at the ready. As a good soldier, the Federal Army should be. <clears throat> Don't say too much, do you? Huh? Peyton? Peyton Farquhar. Hello? Anybody at home? And here I thought you were a true Southern gentleman. I know what you're thinking, Peyton. That maybe you can make that 20-foot drop into the water. And who knows, maybe you're good at that. But after that, your chances for continued survival become pretty slim. Look over there on the bank of the stream, you know what that is? It's the muscle of a cannon. You see, there's an outpost near here. If you really squint, you can see a company of infantry at parade rest. Think of them as spectators, if you want. But if you sincerely want to swim for it, you might just as well be giving them target practice, which, believe me, they don't really need. 
You want to leave your wife a pretty-looking corpse, don't you? Hmm? Still not in the mood for talking, huh? Well, I can understand that, time like this. A man needs to get his thoughts in order, ready himself for... You know. Perhaps I can help you with that. From a purely practical standpoint, I mean. I'm not a priest or anything like that. Truth to tell, my knowledge of matters theological doesn't amount to very much at all. But I can tell you a little bit about how it'll happen. Me and Clements will escort you out to the center of the bridge, then introduce you to Captain Newman. He's a nice man. You'll like him. Me and Clemens salute the captain, then we stand behind him, leaving you face to face with the sergeant. Now, he's not such a nice man, sorry to say, but... Oh, I forgot. You two have already met. Well... When the moment comes, you'll both be standing on opposite ends of the same plank. He stands on the safe end, but you probably already guessed that. And you probably guessed that it's his job to hold the plank in place. Then, when the captain feels the time is right, right for him, not for you, he gives a signal to the sergeant. The sergeant steps aside, the plank tilts, and down you go. <laughs> nah, never having been hanged myself, I can't give you any information on what your final moments on this earth might feel like. But I can tell you, I've seen more than a few of these. And I'm sorry to have to tell you, it doesn't look any too pleasant. Anything to say about that? Well... Well... I am a living man. How's that? Speak up, Peyton. If you got any famous last words, we should hear them. Otherwise, they won't be famous. I am a living man! <laughs> not for much longer. <laughs> no, sir, not for much longer. Captain says we're ready for him. Hear that, Peyton? We're ready for you. They say the Lord hates a coward, so take my advice and try and face it with a smile. Why do you have to do that, Levine? Do what? Taunt him like that. He shouldn't expect anything better. This is war. He was on the wrong side. The wrong side? Do you think he thinks that? I don't give a damn what goes on inside his head. Neither should you, Clemens. And unless you want to end up with a noose around your neck, don't let anyone else hear you talking like that. Now, help me up with him. Uh. Oh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, my darling, what have I done? What have I done to you and the children? I promised you. Promised I'd come back. What is a man if he's not as good as his word? What am I? Secure the noose. The noose. If only I could free my hands. Perhaps I could throw off the noose. Perhaps I really could dive into the stream. I might evade the bullets, and if I swam vigorously enough, reach the bank. Then take to the woods and get away. Get back home. Yes. Home. And back to you, Elizabeth. Thank God home is outside their lines. My wife and little ones are still beyond the invader's farthest advance. That pounding. What is causing that pounding? It's like the stroke of a blacksmith's hammer on the anvil. Is it distant? Nearby? Or both? Perhaps it's my death now. 
feels like a knife being thrust into my ear. Damn them, what's taking them so long? If you're gonna do it, just do it! Sergeant, step away. Too late. My God, it's too late. Oh, Elizabeth. So, how much further is it? What? Much further to where? Where am I? Your home, Mr. Farquhar. How much further? Uh, a little... a little further. Um, yes, a little further. Just keep along this road. I'm sorry, I'm... I'm somewhat confused. Hardly surprising. You've just woken up. It usually takes me a good half hour and a stiff drink before I know my own name. Say, you wouldn't happen to have a stiff drink on you, would you? I'm afraid not. Mm, too bad. No, oh, wait. I can't... I can't have been sleeping. Why not? Look at me, I'm walking. How could I fall asleep walking? Horses fall asleep standing up. But not walking. Well, I don't know about you, but I've got to the end of plenty of days without the faintest idea what I've done. Of course, as I explained to you, Mr. Farquhar, I drink a bit. You know my name. Mm-hmm. You're Mr. Peyton Farquhar. How do you know my name? You told me. I did. Sure you did. Right after I found you on the bank of the river. The bank? The southern bank. When I discovered you, you were digging your fingers into the sand, throwing it over yourself in handfuls, and almost blessing it. That doesn't sound like the sort of thing I'd do. You don't remember? I... No. Well, it's what you did. You said it reminded you of diamonds, rubies, emeralds. I said that. I got the impression there was nothing beautiful you didn't think it resembled. Naturally, I was quite convinced at that moment that you were insane. No offense, sir. Sounds like a very natural reaction. I would have come to the same conclusion. And then you said something that captured my attention. And what was that? Still don't remember? Please, refresh my memory. You said, um, now let me think. This was all good stuff. I don't want to get it wrong. Oh, yes. You noted a definite order in the arrangement of the trees. That a strange, roseate light shone through the spaces among their trunks, and the wind made in their branches the music of Aeolian harps. Well, sir, I've been from one end of this great land to the other, and I've met many madmen. Some of them confined for their own good, some of them elected to high office, but never a madman with such a poetic grasp of the language. That was when I knew you were just too interesting to leave where I found you. I do remember. Now it all comes back to you. Not all of it, not yet, but I remember lying on the bank. I was so content there, more than I've ever been in my... Right then and there, I had no wish to perfect my escape. I was happy to remain in that enchanting spot until they recaptured me. Recaptured, eh? You haven't mentioned that before. Of course, you haven't said much of anything since I found you. You're a man on the run, then. Forgive me, miss... I'm sorry I don't seem to be able to recall your name. It'll come to you. Well, no offense, sir, but I'm not sure it would be wise to tell you the details. You're not a trusting man. Of late, I've become somewhat disappointed in human nature. I'm not sure why. This is a new world, Mr. Farquhar. It's understandable that you'd be cautious. But rest assured, I'm not what you might call 
political. But I do love a good story, if you have one to tell. My story? I have no story. I have a life. A life that's become considerably more interesting of late, I'd venture to say. But beyond your name, I know nothing about you. What manner of man is Peyton Farquhar? Why do you want to know? The road I travel is long and lonely. I'm starved of intelligent conversation, and the only voice I ever hear is my own. Talking to oneself leads inevitably to madness. With you here as my temporary companion, I can stave off that unfortunate condition for at least another day. I see. And tell me, sir, where are you headed? Anywhere I'm welcome and nowhere I'm not. In short, nowhere in particular. So, you were telling me about yourself. <clears throat> Very well. My name is... Peyton Farquhar. Peyton Farquhar. I'm a planter in these parts. A planter, eh? Good to have land. It is. So, I guess you have slaves. Naturally. No need to adopt that tone, Mr. Farquhar. I told you I'm not a political. Just asking. Well, as it happens, I am what you would call a political. The Farquhars are an old and highly respected Alabama family. I'm naturally an original secessionist and ardently devoted to the Southern cause. Oh, your memory is reliable when it comes to the matter of who you are, if not where. I suppose so. And yet, if you'll forgive my temerity, for all your patriotic fervor, you clearly didn't take service with the gallant army of the South. May I ask why that was? Circumstances of an imperious nature prevented me from doing so, but I assure you I chafed under the inglorious restraint Longing for the release of my energies, the larger life of the soldier, the opportunity for distinction. And in good faith and without too much qualification, you assent to at least part of the dictum that all's fair in love and war. Are you mocking me by any chance? I would never, ever risk a fellow traveler's friendship for such a trivial gain. Please, continue, I beg of you. I imagine that the opportunity to serve your birthplace came at last, as it comes to all men in wartime. It did. It was one evening, as I was sitting under the magnolia trees near the entrance to my grounds. I was with my wife, Elizabeth. Children were playing nearby. <sighs> this is the life. It surely is, my dear. It surely is. Look at it. It's all so perfect. I'll tell you frankly, Elizabeth, if I should die this very moment, I'd die a happy man. Peyton, darling, I wish you wouldn't say such ghoulish things. I can't bear the thought. I have no fear, Elizabeth. I have no intention of passing away from sheer bliss. I just wanted to make the point that... Well, that on such a beautiful evening as this, it's almost impossible to believe there is a war. I wish there weren't. But there must be. Why, Peyton? For them. For the sake of the children. They deserve the best future we can give them. Isn't that worth dying for? I understand that, Peyton. I do. It's just that... Oh, I sometimes wonder if we couldn't... Peyton! Look! That soldier is one of ours. Water! Please! You're exhausted. Peyton, should I fetch one of the slaves? By no means. We'll take care of them ourselves. Get him some water, Elizabeth. Let me help you down, sir. Oh, thank you. You must be starved. Come inside, my man. Oh, this is a... This is a splendid meal. Thank you. Some more? Alice, more cornbread. Uh, no, no, please. Uh, this hospitality is far more than I deserve. 
Nonsense, nonsense. Nothing is too good for our brave boys. Tell me, Corporal, whose command are you with? Uh, Colonel Tolliver, 13th North Carolina. How are things at the front? We hear so little down here. I'm sorry to say things are not going so well. Not so well at all. The Yankees are repairing the railroads in preparation for another advance. They've reached the Owl Creek Bridge. Owl Creek Bridge? Yes, sir. They've put it in order and built a stockade on the north bank. I'm sure you know what that'll mean. Yes. If they can run trains over the bridge, there'll be nothing to stop them. <coughs> Damn, those sons of... <sighs> Forgive me, Elizabeth. You shouldn't be subjected to this manner of talk. Peyton, I understand... Go and see what's keeping Alice with the cornbread. As you wish, my dear. Something on your mind, sir? Corporal, refresh my memory. It's about 30 miles to Owl Creek Bridge? About that. Maybe even a little less. And there's no force on this side of the creek? Only a picket post a half mile out, on the railroad. And a single sentinel at our end of the bridge. Suppose a man, or perhaps several men, civilians and persons of intelligence, should elude the picket post and perhaps get the better of the sentinel. What could they accomplish? Hmm. Accomplish? Well, sir, I was there a month ago. I saw that the flood of last winter lodged a great quantity of driftwood against the wooden pier at this end of the bridge. Driftwood, eh? It's dry now. Exceedingly dry. If someone were to put a light to that driftwood, it'd burn like tow. <laughs> that it would, sir. And that would mean the end of the Owl Creek Bridge. I don't think the Yankees would care for that. Not one damn bit would they care for it. And it goes without saying that such a conflagration would seriously hinder the Northern effort. Oh, it would. But you should know, sir, the Commandant's issued an order declaring that any civilian caught interfering with the railroad, its bridges, tunnels, or trains will be summarily hanged. I've seen the order. It's posted everywhere. Risk is a part of life, soldier. You face it every day. I do. That I do. And in my own small way, I've done what I can. No service is too humble to perform in the aid of the South. And should the opportunity present itself, no adventure would be too perilous to undertake if consistent with the character of a civilian who is at heart a soldier, of course. Mr. Farquhar, you are a true son of the South, and a very brave gentleman. Elizabeth! I have to go away. Away? For how long, Peyton? Probably just a couple of days. Why? Business. Larson will be going with me. Maybe Zella, too. I don't know. I'll have to ask him. Peyton, don't go. I don't want you to. The children need you. It's for the sake of the children that I'm doing this, Elizabeth. Why can't you understand that? I do understand. I really do, but I'm afraid. Oh, terrified of losing you. If a man doesn't stand up for what he believes in, then we lose everything. Just promise me one thing. Promise you'll come back to me? I promise. And I'm a man who keeps his promises, my love. Setting fire to the Owl Creek Bridge. Sounds like a most audacious plan. It was. I must confess, Mr. Farquhar, I'm a little confused. How so? You strike me as a competent and determined gentleman. I imagine whatever you want out of life, you get it. That's fair to say. What of it? Simply that I'm surprised your endeavor came to nothing. And what makes you imagine that? <laughs> your present predicament. The absence of your co-conspirators? 
those marks upon your neck? And if someone had set the Owl Creek Bridge alight, I'm sure I would have noticed it in some way. Let me check. Where there's smoke, there's fire, and... <laughs> nope. No smoke. You're a very thorough fellow. For a moment, I thought you might know more of my situation than you let on. From the way you talk, do I take it someone in your party betrayed you? Not in my party. But you recall the corporal who appeared at my plantation? Of course. He was a federal scout. Then you were deliberately entrapped. It seems they wanted to weed out the civilians who might cause them some trouble. If I'd only stayed out a little longer that night, I'd probably have seen that same rider repass my plantation, going northward in the direction from which he'd come. From the Owl Creek Bridge? Precisely. And when you and your co-conspirators... Patriots. ...made your assault on the bridge, the military were waiting for you. They made me watch as they hanged my friends for an act of treachery. The sergeant who put them to death was the same man who lured us there. Mm -mm. Is there no honor in conflict? I've never been accused of having much imagination, but I might have guessed it would be something like that. I would say, sir, that you have too kindly an expression for one whose neck is in the hemp. It isn't. Isn't what? In the hemp. Of course, of course. What I mean, Mr. Farquhar, is that you are clearly no vulgar assassin. Fortunately, the liberal military code makes provision for hanging many kinds of persons. And gentlemen are not excluded. As they fastened the noose around my neck, I tried to fix my thoughts on my family. But there were so many trivial distractions. The water touched to gold by the early sun. A piece of dancing driftwood caught in the sluggish current. The brooding mists under the banks some distance down the stream. Then there was a sharp pressure around my throat, followed by a sense of suffocation. Agony shot from my neck downward through every fiber of my body and limbs like streams of pulsating fire heating me to an intolerable temperature. There was no more thought. Only sensations. The intellectual part of my nature was effaced. I had power only to feel, and feeling was torment. I was conscious of motion, encompassed in a luminous cloud, of which I was now merely the fiery heart Without material substance, I swung through unthinkable arcs of oscillation, like a vast pendulum. But you're here. What? What? I said, you're here. Why is that? The rope, it snapped, and I fell into the stream. With a terrible suddenness, the light about me shot upward. There was a loud splash. Then all was cold and dark. My power of thought was restored, and I knew instantly what had happened. And your hands? Were they still bound? They were. Then forgive me, but why didn't you drown? The noose was tight around my neck. It, it, it kept the water from my lungs. And kept you from breathing. When you get into a predicament, sir, you don't do it by half measures. I suppose not. To die of hanging at the bottom of a river. Even at that moment, it seemed ludicrous to me. I opened my eyes in the darkness. I saw above me a, a gleam of light. Distant. Inaccessible. I was still sinking, and the light became fainter and fainter until it was a mere glimmer. Then it began to grow and brighten, and I knew I was rising toward the surface. Knew it with reluctance, for I was very comfortable. Comfortable? Oh, yes. 
It was a question of preference at that point, you see. To be hanged and drowned, that didn't seem so bad, but to be shot. No, I refused to be shot. It didn't seem fair. I'd say you have a quite singular set of values. Do they offend you? Not at all, not at all. It makes for a more entertaining story, and yours is the most fascinating I've heard in many a year on the road. Please, continue. You're under the water, slowly rising to the surface. Your hands are tied. A sharp pain in my wrists surprised me of the fact that I was trying to free my hands. I gave the struggle my attention as an idler might observe the feet of a juggler without interest in the outcome. Eventually, the cord fell away. My arms parted and floated upward, but I could only dimly make out my hands in the growing light. I watched with a new interest as first one, and then the other pounced upon the noose at my neck. They tore it away and thrust it fiercely aside. Its undulations resembled those of a water snake. And my first thought was to put it back. To put it back? The undoing of the noose had been succeeded by the direst pang that I'd yet experienced. My neck ached horribly, my brain was on fire, my heart gave a great leap and I felt as though it was trying to force itself out of my mouth. My whole body was racked and wrenched with an insupportable anguish. And I imagine the desire to rise to the surface was even greater, no matter what you might find waiting for you there. I wanted to stop myself. Had to stop myself, but my disobedient hands gave no heed to my command. They beat the water vigorously with quick downward strokes, forcing me to the surface. I felt my head emerge. My eyes were blinded by the sunlight. My chest expanded convulsively, and with a supreme and crowning agony, my lungs engulfed a great draft of air. So now you were in full possession of your physical senses. If anything, they were more keen and alert than before. I felt the ripples on my face, heard their separate sounds as they struck. I looked at the forest on the bank of the stream, saw the individual trees, the leaves, and the veining of each leaf, saw the very insects upon them, the locusts, the brilliant-bodied flies, the spiders stretching their webs from twig to twig, the prismatic colors in all the dewdrops on a million blades of grass, the humming of the gnats that danced above the eddies of the stream, the beating of the dragonfly's wings. They all made audible music. Remarkable. If you'll forgive my saying so, you missed your life's calling. You have quite a turn for descriptive language. I'm surprised you had the time to note your surroundings in such detail. Uh, it may only have been a few seconds, I'm not really sure. I seem to have lost the ability to judge the passage of time accurately. Or perhaps you've gained a greater appreciation of time. There's a whole world in every second. You have a singular turn of phrase yourself, mister. I'll get it in a minute. No doubt. Did you acquire this philosophical outlook during your travels? Hard to say. See, it often seems like I've been traveling my whole life. But enough about me. I long to hear your story. You've painted a beautiful background for me, but it strikes me there are more pressing issues in this particular picture. For example, your executioners. My would-be executioners. That goes without saying, surely. Very well. I saw them, silhouetted against the blue sky. They shouted, they gesticulated. Their movements were grotesque and horrible. Their forms, gigantic. Suddenly, I heard a sharp report and something struck the water smartly within a few inches of my head, spattering my face with spray. One of the officers had his rifle. At his shoulder, there was a light cloud of blue smoke rising from the muzzle. I was surprised he missed. I read somewhere that marksmen with gray eyes are the keenest shots. This fellow was the exception to the rule, it seems. The marksman had gray eyes? Mm-hmm. 
How could you see that? I'm sorry? He was on the Owl Creek Bridge. You were in the water. And you must have drifted some distance. So, how did you know the marksman had gray eyes? I... don't know how I know. I just... I must have noticed it on the bridge. Just before your execution? My intended execution. As you say. Doubtless the detail was burned into my mind. Doubtless. I told you how much more alive my senses had become at that moment. Alive. Yes, indeed. That you did. That you did. At that moment, a counter-swirl turned me half round. I was looking into the forest on the bank opposite the fort. A clear, high voice rang out and came across the water with a distinctness that pierced and subdued all other sounds, even the beating of the ripples. The voice... What did it say? It said... Attention, company! Ready! Aim! How did you do that? Run! Are they still behind us? No. No, I don't think so. All right. That's enough for now. No more running for my life. Your what? Wait. I need to get my bearings. I have to know how close I am to my destination. Closer than you think, I'm sure. Eh? Does anything look familiar, Mr. Farquhar? Ah, uh, yes. This way. I think. Yes. This way. Can you see your home? Not yet. But it's not far now. I intend to be back in my wife's arms by close of day. You gave her your word. That I did. And that's important to you. It's a matter of honor. An honor, Mr... Ah, uh, honor means as much as love to a man of the South. A very moving sentiment. Now, where were we? Where were we with what? Your story. My story? Yes. You were just reaching a most exciting point when we were interrupted. I longed to know what happened next. Are you quite insane, sir? I don't believe so. But I thought the same of you when I first met you, so I suppose it's a fair question. I am in full possession of all my faculties, Mr... Mr... Everything except the memory, eh? Don't try my patience, sir. I wouldn't dream of it. You ask me an important question, and I'm doing my best to answer it. But... You'll appreciate it's difficult to judge these things when one spends so much time alone. If I had a constant companion, someone to tell me if and when I appeared to be losing my senses, that might be helpful, but that's not what fate has in store for me. And as I say, I try to avoid talking to myself because that seems to me the fastest route to madness. But... Mad or sane, I know a good tale when I hear it, and yours is the most entertaining I have heard in all my years. Yes, sir, I shall cherish the memory of your experiences when I have long since ceased my wanderings. Please, go on. You'd escape the noose by a most improbable stroke of good fortune, and then you found yourself in the stream and under fire. What was that like? Surely you can imagine that for yourself. We were just under fire a few minutes ago. But not in the water. Well, does it matter? Does to me. It's the setting that makes the crucial difference. Please. Very well. I suppose it might make the journey shorter, at least. Not mine. I dived to avoid the shots. Dived as deeply as I could. Water roared in my ears like the voice of Niagara, yet still I heard the dull thunder of the volley. 
those heightened senses of yours. I rose again towards the surface and was met again by more shining Yankee lead. One shot nicked my cheek, do you see it? I see it. Well, the next time I dove, I was a long time underwater and I made damn certain I swam farther downstream and nearer to safety. Just as well since the soldiers had almost finished reloading. The two sentinels positioned at either end of the bridge fired again, independently and ineffectually. I saw all this over my shoulder. I was now swimming vigorously with the current. My brain was as energetic as my arms and legs. I fought with the rapidity of lightning. I reasoned, you see, that the captain had probably already given the command to fire at will. And you surely couldn't dodge all the shots. You're not invulnerable. No man is. Then an appalling splash. Just two yards away was followed by a loud, rushing sound which seemed to travel back through the air to the nearby fort and died in an explosion which stirred the very river to its deeps. A rising sheet of water curved over me, fell down upon me, blinded me, strangled me. The cannon had taken a hand in the game. Did I tell you about the cannon? You must have done. Hmm. Well, anyways, as I shook my head free from the commotion of the smitten water, I heard the deflected shot humming through the air ahead. And in an instant, it was cracking and smashing the branches in the forest beyond. I was certain they wouldn't be so far from their target next time. And it was a good gun. The report lagged behind the missile. But surely the smoke would have apprised you of another shot. So long as you kept your eye on the gun, you had a certain advantage, am I correct? You are? The problem was how to reach the shore without turning my back on the cannon. You have my complete attention, sir. How did you manage it? Well, I... don't know. I'm not sure. I felt myself whirled round and round, spinning like a top. The water, the banks, the forest, the distant bridge, fort, and soldiers, they were all somehow commingled, blurred. I could no longer make out objects, only colors, circular horizontal streaks of color. It was all I saw. I was caught in a vortex. I felt giddy and sick. Fascinating. Incredible. What is that damned hammering? I don't hear anything. Unless it's the ticking of your watch you can hear. My watch? <laughs> You're lucky it still works after such an immersion. It is my watch. But why should I think... Perhaps you're the sort of man who values the seconds as much as the minutes and the hours. And there's a whole world in a second, so I've been told. So how did you fight your way out of this... this vortex? I really have no idea. The next thing I knew, I was on the road with you at my side, heading for home as I promised. Surely not. I mean, you obviously avoided the cannon and struggled to the bank. Obviously. But I have no memory of it. And of our meeting? I recall only what you told me about it. Most curious. Stop! What is it? This is it. We're here. This is the path to my home. Excellent. Well... I suppose this is where we part company, Mr. Farquhar. May I say, it's been a rare pleasure. You, uh, you wouldn't care to come in? I'm sure the servants could prepare you a meal. That won't be necessary, my friend. I have many miles still to travel. But your journey is almost at an end. Yes. Well... Goodbye, Mr... I'm sorry, I thought I could recall your name, but it just escapes me. Call me Ambrose. I wish you well, Ambrose. 
And you, Mr. Peyton Farquhar. And you. Home. Almost home. How long? How long since that damn imposter rode down this road? How long since I was drawn to the Owl Creek Bridge? I would say, sir, that you have too kindly an expression for one whose neck is in the hem. It is. Is it what? In the hem. Of course, of course. I promised I'd return, Elizabeth. Oh, so perfect. They couldn't keep me from Just you. Just before your execution. My intended execution. As you say. Not even a noose around my neck could stop me from coming back to you, to the family. Yes, indeed. I told you how much more alive my senses had become at that moment. That moment. Alive. Alive. Yes, indeed. I saw them. <laughs> <laughs> John, Elizabeth! don't tease your sister. I want to put on your best behavior when your father returns. Elizabeth! Hey. Elizabeth! You're not getting vulnerable. No man is. Elizabeth! Elizabeth! I swore I'd come back to you. I promised. Hey. Elizabeth! Hey. Elizabeth! Hey! Oh, hey! Peyton, my love. Elizabeth, let me hold you. Let me take you in my... Oh. Oh. There's a whole world in every second. He's dead, Captain. Good work. That's the last execution for today. Get him down! You know, Levine, for a moment there, I, I thought that rope wasn't gonna hold. It's strong enough. It did its job. Do you ever wonder what goes on inside a man's head in those last seconds before death? Like I said before, Clemens, I don't give a damn. And neither should you. An occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, in two forms, as it was dreamed and as it was lived and died. This is the stuff of fantasy, the thread of imagination, the ingredients of the Twilight Zone. An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, starring Christian Stolte with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by M.J. Elliott and based on the short story by Ambrose Bierce. Heard in the cast were Rob Riley, Danny Goldring, William Dick, Susan Hart, Gonzo Schexnader, and John Hoganocker. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced by Carl Lamari and directed by Joe B. Cerny for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design, custom Foley effects, recording, and editing are done in the Cerny American Sound to Picture Theater by sound designers Craig Lee, Todd Beyer, and Tim Cerny. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking.